Thank you for joining us. Welcome. This session is to discuss the graduate programs in the Department of Mechanical Engineering offered through the Whiting School of Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. My name is Ayana Teal and I am the Assistant Director of Recruitment and Marketing for the Whiting School of Engineering. We will begin this session with a brief overview of Johns Hopkins Engineering. Then to provide you with a program overview and give you an opportunity to get answers to your questions, we will have professor and former chair, Dr. Lewis Whitcomb join us. Lewis is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and is renowned for innovative robotics research and development for space, underwater, and other extreme environments, as well as novel systems for medicine and industry. He holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Computer Science. Lewis will now introduce a graduate student to help us answer questions, further questions that we have this morning. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dylan uh, Mattisetti, who is a third year student? No, I'm second, second year. Second year student. Um, would you like to introduce yourself, yeah. Dylan? Sure. So my name is Dylan Mattisetti. I am a current PhD student studying uh, modeling uh, single crystal plasticity. So that's a lot of discrete dislocation dynamics and um, just running simulations uh, regarding that. So that's, that's really fun. Uh, first year here is a lot of class, so I'm just stepping into research now, but I'm excited to do so. And what were you doing? Uh, we'll talk a little bit more to Dylan, but before uh, here at being here at Hopkins, you were at Google? Yeah, so I, I took a, a year to work at Google before, so I was doing some um, uh, machine learning research then. Good, and we'll circle back to Dylan in a little bit, uh, and he'll tell you a little bit about his experience uh, coming to Hopkins, a little bit about his research, where he, is, he runs uh, simulations on, on thousands of computers simultaneously. Yep. Great, thank you both for those introductions. All right, moving on. Today we will discuss engineering at the Johns Hopkins University, an overview in the program, the admissions process, some important dates, specific research areas, graduate student life, and finally a live question and answer. You can type any questions you have in the live chat at any time, and we will address those at the end of the formal presentation. Johns Hopkins University was the nation's first research university founded for the express purpose of putting discovery and knowledge to work for the good of humanity. Today, we are a top tier university and remain committed to academic excellence and pioneering research. For the past 38 years, Hopkins has led the U.S. higher education in research and development, spending a record $2.43 billion in fiscal 16, and that amount increases every year. The Whiting School of Engineering is home to 11 graduate programs and more than 25 research centers and institutes. Because our research is interdisciplinary, our faculty works closely with the eight other divisions, including the School of Medicine, Applied Physics Laboratory, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our expertise includes medicine and engineering, defense, information engineering, and resilient systems. It is the mission of the Whiting School to provide its students with an outstanding engineering education that is innovative, rigorous, and relevant, and prepares its graduates to be 21st century leaders. Some of the career resources available to our students include the Life Design Lab, where there are counselors specifically dedicated to graduate students, employer and alumni networking events, and resources for entrepreneurship. And now I will pass it along to Lewis Whitcomb, who will provide you with a program overview and other information regarding the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, so I've been a faculty member in the Department of Mechanical Engineering for a number of years. My area of research is robotics uh, and uh, dynamical systems and control. Uh, the uh, uh, mechanical engineering is uh, nationwide the largest, uh, uh, the, uh, the engineering field with the largest number of graduate students um, in engineering. And uh, our, <clears throat> our department focuses on, on several different research areas, uh, including robotics, modeling control, uh, fluid mechanics, uh, mechanics of material, um, and this is what Dylan is an expert on, and mechanics in biology and medicine. Right now we have about uh, 27 faculty. We've got, um, uh, I think that number is a little bit low, 120, uh, oh, no, that's right, 120 PhD students and about 60 master's students. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our research areas. I gave you sort of an overview a minute ago of, of uh, the broad research areas. And uh, if you dive a little bit deeper, 
Um, we have uh, experts on our faculty and staff in robotics, uh, also in systems modeling and control, mechanics and materials, a uh, broad area that uh, covers both uh, uh, mechanical engineering and material science. Um, this is where Dylan is, a, is an expert. Um, micro and nanoscale science and engineering. Uh, we have experts in mechanical engineering and biology and medicine who mathematically model things like cells and molecules. We have uh, experts uh, such as Denise Gain um, and Charles Menevo who are studying energy in the environment, uh, studying things like wind farms um, and network energy systems. Um, and we have uh, traditionally been strong for, uh, for almost 100 years in uh, fluid mechanics and heat transfer. Um, so the PhD program requirements um, uh, are uh, pretty straightforward. The PhD requirements are a little bit different at every PhD program. Most PhD students uh, coming in with a bachelor's degree take five or six years. Um, if you come in with a master's degree, um, it might be uh, four or five years. Uh, it varies with the student. And students normally begin by taking uh, courses. Uh, their first year in the PhD program is usually fairly course heavy. Um, and then it begins to lighten up in the second year as you focus more on research. Um, after two terms of study, uh, this slide is a little bit out, out of date, um, you take an oral exam called a department qualifying oral exam or DQE, and um, that's normally done about one year after matriculation now. And, the, uh, and then after about five terms of study, uh, you take a second oral exam called the graduate board oral exam. Um, the first exam is, uh, is with a, a examining committee of uh, four faculty members from the department. And it normally focuses on uh, subjects from your area of research or so subjects from courses that you've taken. The graduate board oral exam is normally uh, given by five examiners, three of whom are outside the department, two of whom are inside the department. And again, the uh, questions are normally directed in your area of research, as well as uh, in areas of courses that you've taken. Students uh, normally, after they finish, students normally end up taking approximately on the order of 12 or so uh, uh, semester-long uh, graduate courses as part of their PhD research, uh, sorry, PhD education, um, and then write a dissertation. Um, and the final uh, act of finishing your thesis um, is presenting your thesis defense. And um, the average time to completion these days, Mike, is about five years. Yep. Yeah. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Bernard, um, who is the manager of our uh, both undergraduate and graduate academic programs. Hi, everybody. And so Mike is the heart and soul of the program. And whenever I have questions about the program that I don't know how to answer, I ask Mike. We have a growing master's program as well. Most uh, students uh, complete the master's pr program in three to four semesters. Um, and uh, the degree requirements are that you either take uh, 10 courses uh, or you take eight courses and write a master's thesis, which at Hopkins is called uh, an essay. And there are some details uh, in uh, the course distribution, and if you're interested in learning more about the details, you can take a look at our master's advising guide, which is available on our website. Um, and right now, I'd say most of our students do the course masters. Um, and what percentage of our students would you say are doing the uh, the thesis option, Mike? I would say right now maybe a quarter, mm -hmm. and that's slowly increasing. There's a large interest in doing the essays here. Yeah, students, students are more and more interested in doing the, uh, the thesis option or essay option, as it's called here at Hopkins. So for PhD, um, uh, the, uh, our, uh, selective, the GPA of our incoming students is typically about 3.8 out of 4 or higher. Um, and the GRE scores are right at the very top of the scale. Um, it's uh, important for students to be able to communicate effectively in uh, the uh, spoken language of the courses, which is English. And so we expect to have a TOEFL score of 100 or above. And um, all of our admitted PhD students uh, are either offered uh, full uh, financial support, either from the department or from their prospective research advisor. And a number of our, of our incoming PhD students have external fellowships, for example, from the National Science Foundation um, or the uh, NDSEG uh, Defense Science and Engineering Research Fellowships. Um, our incoming MSc class is also are really great students. They typically have a GPA of uh, of, uh, in the upper uh, three-point uh, scale out of four, um, and uh, really top GRE scores. And, uh, and, as, and as well, uh, the incoming students have uh, a, a total score of 100 or above. Uh, so the admissions process is that you need to, uh, in order to be considered for, for admissions, you need to apply. <laughs> and the uh, application deadline is December 15th. The application uh, is an online system in Slate. 
Uh, this cycle, application cycle, is the second time that we've been using the Slate application system. So hopefully we've worked out some of the bugs. The application process uh, involves uh, you need to uh, write an application essay with a statement of purpose. Uh, you need to uh, recruit three referees uh, to uh, provide letters of re recommendation. And you need to send us your GRE and TOEFL score, as well as the transcripts from your previous institutions, whether that's an uh, undergraduate institution with a bachelor's degree or a previous master's degree. Uh, after December 15th, the faculty review the application, and the, the admissions committee makes its decision on PhD applicants uh, towards the end of January. Um, and the MSc decisions uh, are made by the, by the, uh, by the admissions committee uh, in February. So um, that's a brief overview of the program. Um, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Dylan, uh, who's a second year PhD student, um, and he can tell you a little bit about his origin story, what he did before Hopkins, and uh, what he's doing here, and what he plans to do afterwards. Sure. So my name is Dylan Matasetti. I grew up in the Caribbean on the island of Dominico. I went to the University of South Carolina, and then I worked for a year at Google before really settling in at Hopkins. So. Uh, right now, I'm really trying to dive deep into my research and uh, work on uh, new, interesting methods of discrete dislocation dynamics. And for, for those for those students who aren't mechanics and materials uh, folks, yeah. uh, what is a dislocation dynamics relevant for? So uh, dislocations are structural uh, lattice mismatches in metals. So or it can be anything, but metals in particular, and they allow for plasticity. So um, I love to give the example of if you have a spring and you stretch too far, the spring will not go back. So it's, it's, um, unfortunately, I, I had a, a GIF here, but I don't, I don't think it will work. So I'm, I'm sorry about that, but that was just a nice little dislocation uh, visualization. What, what's really exciting to me is I love working with computers and I love solving physical systems. So it seemed like a really nice match when I when I came here. But one of the, the biggest choices for me was uh, that advisor, that advisor uh, personal touch. Um, I won't mention other school names, but I don't think that's everywhere. Uh, one of the schools I got in, they were like, great, you're in. Um, good luck. I was like, what do you mean? Where, where's my support? And Hopkins really goes out of their way to make sure that you you are matched and um, you, you have funding. You don't have the the worries that you might have elsewhere. So. Well, that's an important point because um, our incoming PhD students and master's students are assigned to, um, uh, PhD students are assigned to a research advisor uh, upon admission, and our master's students uh, uh, are assigned to an academic advisor upon admission. So uh, it's not a free-for-all in terms of academic advising. And you can change your advisor if, if you'd like to, um, and basically by just talking to other faculty members um, and then ask Mike, Mike Bernard to assign you to a new advisor if you like. And so one of the things that's exciting to me about Dylan's research is that he models um, materials and metals, and he's modeling how the actually atoms move within those metals and how, the, how to design these materials to make them stronger and lighter. Um, and uh, he does that not experimentally. We've got people in the department who do experiments with, with materials, and they squish them in, in, in strong machines and things like that. But Dylan tests them in supercomputers. Uh, so he models them, and he runs, uh, he runs his code on hundreds and thousands of processors um, on, the, on the supercomputer that we have. Uh, uh, your Hopkins. Great, thank you for that, Dylan. Okay, now I'll just briefly talk a little bit. Sorry, a little bit more about the graduate student experience at Hopkins. You will have the ability um, to find community a little bit about what Dylan was talking about. Having the support of your faculty, you will also have support of your colleagues, your fellow graduate students. We offer. Um, the opportunity to be a part of various graduate student organizations, including the Graduate Queer Straight Alliance, um, the GROW Graduate Repre Representative Organization. We have mentoring programs, Mentoring to Inspire Diversity in Science, Women of Whiting, Indian, Indian Graduate Students Association, Chinese Graduate Students Association, the Black Grad Student Association. So as listed here, there, there are many more. There are various opportunities for you to engage with your fellow graduate students and impact the community on an even deeper level. We are very proud to be Baltimoreans here. As you know, when choosing a graduate program, you're also choosing a city to be a part of for four to seven years. Um, Baltimore is the home of Artscape, which is the largest free art festival on the East Coast. We are a foodie city, Zagat ranked number two in 2015. 
We are the home of the Under Armour HQ, Chesapeake Bay, Hunfest. We have two major league sports teams. The Ravens are doing really well right now, if any of you are interested in that. And Entrepreneur Magazine rated us as one of the nation's hot startup cities in 2018. Now I will hand it off to Lewis to discuss a little bit about alumni and PhD graduate outcomes. Sure. Um, our PhD graduates, um, when they graduate, know more than anybody else in the world uh, about the, their uh, topic of research. And uh, they typically go on to uh, either faculty positions um, or positions in industry or in government or academic research laboratories. And um, uh, this slide lists some of the companies and government laboratories and academic programs uh, where our uh, students over the last five years uh, have gone to after they graduated from PhD programs. But I'd say that most of the folks that, uh, that complete a PhD end up doing research uh, one way or the other. They're really focused on, on doing research. And these days, uh, research doesn't happen only uh, at the university. It also happens uh, at uh, industrial laboratories. Our MSc graduates, most of our MSc graduates uh, matriculate in the MSc program for one of two reasons. Uh, either they see the MSc as a terminal degree as an entry point uh, into the workforce as a practicing engineer, um, or they see it as a stepping stone to a PhD program either here or elsewhere. And Mike, what, what would you say is the fraction of our MSc students that go on to uh, further graduate study? Approximately? In our department, um, not too many. I would say maybe 10 to 15 will stay for our PhD program. Mm -hmm. There might be a small group that goes on to another school's PhD yeah. program. I don't have that specifically, right. but so, the vast majority would go in the industry. Yeah, so I'm guessing that about roughly a quarter to a third go on to further mm -hmm. PhDs, uh, further graduate study, either here or elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, sort of on the order of two thirds, uh, go into industry or government labs um, uh, where, they're, uh, where they'll be actually practicing engineering. Great. And that is the end of our formal presentation. We've had some questions come in. The first question from Ms. Patel, she's asking about GRE specifically a quantitative of 170 and verbal of 161. Oh, sure. Yeah, let me answer that. Um, if you're concerned that you have one score of your exam a little lower than what you've shown, uh, don't panic at this point. We would still encourage an application because we do look at the full application. It's not just the test scores. Uh, it's also your recommendation letters. It's how well you're doing in your current school and your statement of purpose that will give us a well-rounded application to figure out if um, you would be compatible for our uh, program. Great. Thank you for that, Mike. And Ayana, you are very special because we have the same name, has the next question. Um, since you are assigned an advisor upon admission, are you able to start doing research as soon as you start? Uh, my experience with uh, incoming students is that uh, they're normally applying uh, during the final year of, of matriculation in their previous program, whether that's a bachelor's or master's. Um, and uh, many students uh, have internships they do over the summer. So most students uh, begin the research uh, if, when they matriculate uh, in late August or early September, depending on how the calendar is going, um, I encourage uh, uh, my, my, my assigned advisees, if they're interested in doing research, if they can, to spend the summer before they actually start taking, uh, before they matriculate here, uh, getting involved in research. And some do that and some, some don't. So it is possible to get involved in research uh, before classes start uh, in late August or early September. Um, but that, uh, in order to do that, you need to show initiative and, and get yourself here, find a place to live, um, and get started with your with your advisor. Great, thank you for that. The next question, what is the usual course structure for master's programs? Are all courses in person? Are they mainly lecture-based? Uh, this information session is for, is uh, uh, concerns our full-time graduate programs. Um, and the courses that we offer on this campus are almost all in person. Um, and there are very few courses that, uh, that we offer um, electronically. Uh, we do have a separate master's program uh, called the Engineering for Professionals, and uh, that's uh, an almost completely online master's program, and it's designed for engineers who are working full-time and want to take one course at a time and complete a master's degree in two or three years. If you want to learn more about the distance learning masters that we have, then, then um, uh, I direct you to our website, ep.jhu.edu, for our Engineering for Professionals. It's one of the largest uh, distance master's programs in the country. Um, and 
if you're here as a full-time student on this campus, a uh, Perman campus, you can take uh, distance learning courses uh, from the EP courses and count it towards your full-time degree, and some of our students do that. Great, thank you for that. Um, for the PhD, do you recommend applying, I'm sorry, do you recommend touching base with them prior to applying, referring to the faculty of interest? And that is from Mr. Garcia. Absolutely, it's a great idea. All right, and the next question, the average scores presented was the arithmetic mean or the median? I'm, I'm thinking she is referring to the GRE scores. Uh, mm -hmm. So the GRC, the GRE scores that we listed on that slide um, are, I would say that they are guidelines that we use, and they're not hard limits. So if you're if you fall below one or more of those uh, scores, it doesn't mean that you won't, your application will be considered. Your application will absolutely be considered. We gave those numbers as representative numbers of our matriculating incoming classes. Would you like to add anything to that, Mike? Um, yeah, that's, that's typically correct. Now, I've seen a wide variety of uh, scores, especially in the verbal and analytical. The quantitative is pretty much um, close to set, as in do as best as you can in your quantitative score. Uh, the verbal and analytical, I've seen scores that range anywhere from, for the analytical, like three on up. The, um, the verbal, usually I've seen 50th percentile on up. Of course, you want to do as well as you can in both of those two. The next question from Hamza, can the total exam be waived if they study the masters in the U.S. for a PhD applicant? Yes, it can. Okay, great. Joseph is asking about who to contact about transfer credits. He is a senior undergrad currently taking graduate courses. That would, if, assuming you're admitted and you join us, Joseph, uh, you could contact me, Mike Bernard, and we'll talk about that later. And what's important in that case is that um, uh, I think you can transfer graduate courses that you've taken elsewhere as up to two courses, uh, as long as you haven't counted them towards a degree elsewhere. That's right. So, so for example, if you're in a master's degree at the at, uh, at Harvard and you take uh, uh, two graduate courses and you don't count them towards your bachelor's degree at Harvard, then you'd be able to transfer those mm -hmm. courses uh, to here Absolutely. and count them towards your master's degree here. Yeah. Okay, great. The next question for the MS thesis option, is finding an advisor required before the application starts? No, it's not required before the application starts, um, but you can, it's not required, but you certainly can do it uh, because you certainly can pursue a potential uh, master's thesis advisor um, uh, while you're applying um, and uh, during the matric matriculation process. I'd say that um, if you want to do the uh, a master's thesis, um, the sooner you get uh, paired up with a thesis advisor, the better, uh, because the sooner you get uh, paired up with a research advisor, the sooner you can get started on your research. And it's mind you, it's generally agreed that doing the thesis option versus the course option is more work. I'd say that uh, students that do the thesis option typically take a full two years to accomplish it. And in particular, if you um, uh, do the thesis option, you want to make sure that this summer between your first and second years, you can you can completely devote towards your thesis research. The next question from May, if I apply for PhD but get enrolled as MS, can I still talk with advisors and apply for PhD after starting the master's? Absolutely. Yeah, there's, a, I'd say, um, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but at least 10% of our, probably 10%-ish mm -hmm. of, our, of our master's uh, students um, get really interested in research and apply to the PhD program while they're here. Um, some go on to the PhD program here, some go on to uh, PhD programs elsewhere. Okay, Elizabeth is asking about the master's in biology and medicine and how it compares to BME, the imaging device focus. Okay, I use the term uh, uh, mechanics in biology and medicine meaningfully because, for example, in BME, there's a lot of BME that's just concerned with sort of the molecular nature of cells and and uh, and what's going on with the with the chemistry um, and uh, signaling pathways um, at the cellular or molecular level. The, the uh, faculty and students who are working in mechanics and biology and medicine here are concerned with the mathematical modeling of the physics of, of living tissues. And we have people like Sean Sun, uh, who studies how the molecular engines, like the ATP molecule, actually work, how they convert energy uh, into actual physical motion, and they cause our muscles to move. We have uh, people like Jeff Wang, uh, who studies um, uh, mechanics and biology and medicine, in medicine at the cellular level, where he's uh, concerned with identifying single cells, uh, single cancer cells, and we have 
faculty members like uh, Vicki Gwynn, uh, uh, who studies uh, mechanics of soft tissues. And so she studies tissues at the, at, the, at the sort of organ level where she thinks about the materials. And in particular, she collaborates uh, very extensively with, uh, medical, with uh, medical researchers at the Wilmer Eye Institute at the School of Medicine, understanding the mechanics of, of uh, eye tissue. And then we have uh, folks who study the whole organism, such as Noah Cowan, who studies how electric knife fish uh, use electrosense to sense their environment, and Chen Li, who um, uh, studies uh, how uh, legged animals locomote uh, over porous and uh, aggregate surfaces. We have uh, faculty members who study and mathematically model uh, living systems on scales from the uh, single molecules to the entire organism. Um, motion is saying he meant GPA. I think you're. I think that was a question about the median. Or yes. So I believe the same answer applies. It's a holistic review of application, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so just because your GPA falls below that 3.8 doesn't mean that your application won't be reviewed. Right. That's right. That's correct. All applications get read. Great. The next question um, from Matthew, is the TOEFL exam required for non-international students? If you're an American citizen and or if your native language is English, then no. Joseph is asking if the master's thesis can be done in industry, example, Medtronic for a co-op. Uh, yes, it can. We have a, a brand new collaboration with the Institute for Nanobiotechnology here on campus where they are expanding a list of available companies who are willing to take on students to work in a co-op that would be used to create the essay for the degree. If you go to our website, me.jhu.edu, select graduate and then you'll see an, a page for masters that'll give you links to those pages that'll give you more details and it'll have my contact information as well you can contact me for details too great that is good news naomi is asking where graduate students tend to live grad students tend to live usually within about a mile of campus uh, sometimes within blocks of campus there are a lot of uh, housing opportunities around some uh, really neat apartment buildings uh, as well as townhomes here in the Charles Village neighborhood that are, I believe, relatively reasonable. I'm looking at Dylan to see. I, um, I, uh, or do you live in this area? I don't no, know. I don't live in this area. Oh, okay. Well, I, I bike to work. Uh, uh, there you go. My okay. Halfway, but, but there are, um, and then uh, the neighborhoods around this area are vibrant, really fun, a lot of good opportunities to find places to live at all kinds of socioeconomic levels. Where do, you, where do you live, Dylan? Uh, so I live in Res mm -hmm. which is just south of Druid Park, which is really mm -hmm. nice. The zoo is great if you get a chance. Yeah. How long does it take you to bike into the campus? Um, well, it matters if I'm late for something. Yeah. But <laughs> I would say 15 to, to 20 minutes. Yeah. It's, it's not bad. Yeah. And there's a bike pathway the entire way. So. Yeah. I, I live just, uh, just north of campus, um, uh, exactly two kilometers from where I'm sitting here. And um, if I drive in, uh, it takes about 10 minutes, and if I bike in, it takes six to eight minutes uh, to get to campus. And um, I'd say that uh, if you're looking on a Google map of, of the Homewood campus, then I'd say that a significant fraction of students live just east of the Homewood campus in an area called Charles Village, uh, just north of campus in an area called Roland Park, uh, or just west of campus in an area called Hamden. I think that I think a significant number of students uh, live in, in those areas. Mount Vernon also, there's also a Facebook page. Um, yeah. I don't know if you all are familiar with it, but there's a Facebook page where you can um, get housing. It's a Hopkins only page. You have to have a Hopkins ID. I mean, jhu.edu email address. You can access that. So yeah, you can find a great place to live when you're here. The next question is from Alan. Is there a time limit for graduate transfer credits? He has an MSME, but graduated eight years ago. Uh, well, in that case, um, you don't have if you're if you have a master's already and you're coming to our program, you don't even have to worry about transferring credits per se. What is viewed for you is your experience as a student wherever you've earned your coursework. You can take additional courses here at your and your advisor's uh, consultation and um, in your advisor's recommendation as to what courses are needed to help you have the knowledge that you need to do the research for your eventual dissertation. And Hamza is asking, can current master's students non-coterminal transfer to Hopkins? I think, I think what this uh, student is asking is, if they've finished, uh, say, 
one semester in a master's program elsewhere, could, could they apply for admission to uh, Hopkins and then transfer those credits, Mike? Uh, you can you can apply for admission. You can transfer. You can apply for admission here, and up again up to two courses from other universities can be a degree. So if you've taken two at your current university and you want to come here and are admitted, likely those can count toward a bachelor's degree could be counted. Yeah, and and. Uh, I would say that you can transfer eligible courses. So the courses that are relevant to the degree program to mechanical right. engineering, and that's that's something that would be determined uh, by your advisor uh, in consultation with our uh, our uh, dean's office. Okay, great. The next question from May: Are recommendation letters due the same time as the application, or will there be more time allowed for recommenders to submit their letters? Uh, there will be more time. Uh, so it'd be great to receive them by December 15th, but uh, it's not totally necessary. We've received recommendation letters as late as a few weeks after that deadline. Uh, what happens is when the um, application is submitted, the application system will contact your recommenders asking for an uploaded letter. And I believe the application system will uh, indicate whether uh, the folks that you've asked for recommendations have actually submitted it or not. So you can check mm -hmm. to see whether they, they've uh, done what you asked them. And here's my recommendation, what I always tell to my undergraduates, advisees, uh, in order to, uh, you need to have a minimum of three uh, recommendations. And so you should uh, ask for those recommendations from uh, either faculty members who you've taken classes with um, or uh, faculty members that you've done research with, if you've done research in your current program, or if you've done an internship, uh, somebody at the company uh, who knows your work. Uh, the most important thing is, is that they actually know you and know your work either in class or, or in research or in engineering. Don't ask them two days before the deadline. Right. And so you want to ask them a minimum of four weeks before the deadline. And what you want to provide them is um, uh, a list of the uh, graduate programs that you're going to be applying to. Um, and so we get top students and we know they're going to be applying to top 10 programs in the country. Um, and so provide uh, your referees with a list of the programs you're applying to what the deadline is for each of the programs, because it'll all be a little different. Provide them with a copy of your resume. Provide them with a, a copy of your transcript from your previous programs. And if you have it written already, uh, provide them with a copy of your statement of objectives. Uh, so, for example, if you want to uh, go and study robotics uh, or uh, study uh, aerospace orbital mechanics, you know, say that in your essay so that your referee can read that together with what they know about you and your transcript and write a letter that speaks directly to your and uh, uh, career trajectory. Great, thank you for that, Lewis. The next question, is there a reference to see the courses offered through offered each semester? Uh, yes, there is. In the mechanical engineering website, um, under the graduate section, we have a uh, set of anticipated course schedules for the next two years. Um, Hopkins also has a course catalog where you can look up our program and see all courses that are offered that will be offered at some point. And if um, a good thing to look at in, in graduate programs you're considering, and, and, and our program as well, is the um, master's or PhD advising manuals, which are available online. Mm -hmm. Because um, the advising manuals will uh, discuss the different uh, tracks or concentrations that um, are normally pursued at the program and the list representative courses uh, that students in these different concentrations would normally take. Uh, so that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Great. The next question, for the master's program, is it possible to take elective courses outside of MECI? Yes. Um, so our degree program requirements state for the uh, master's degree all course option that four of the ten courses uh, be mechanical engineering courses, and it's three of eight if you're doing the essay option. Now that said, elective courses would have to be reviewed by your advisor to ensure that they still fit the parameters of our master's degree program. If you're thinking of elective courses for fun outside of the degree requirements itself, sure, you can do so. Um, it might take a little time, a little more time to finish your degree. But again, any questions on courses, your advisor and I can help you out with that. Yes, and so for example, in my area of robotics and controls, it's very, it's very common for my master's and PhD students to be taking courses in applied math, in computer science, in electrical and computer engineering and uh, and and pure and pure math, uh, so that's perfectly normal in both our masters and PhD programs. Mm -hmm. I'd say that mechanical engineering is extremely interdisciplinary, um, and our degree requirements reflect that. Great. 
The next question, should I get in touch with the faculty to secure an RA or TA before application? It's a good idea to, uh, if you're interested in doing research, um, it's a good idea to contact uh, faculty members um, during the application process. Uh, if you haven't done that before the application process and you're admitted, then um, then do so after, you, after you're admitted. And uh, the research assistantships are normally uh, allocated and, and determined by a faculty member. And teaching assistantships, there are two ways that programs do teaching assistantships. Some programs offer uh, TA ships, which take a lot of hours per week, um, and they come with uh, full tuition and stipend support. Uh, that's not the way we do it. Our RA ships uh, uh, for our PhD students come with uh, full funding and stipend support. Our teaching assistant ships are essentially a part-time job where you get paid a, a modest amount of money. You know, uh, might vary between 500 and a couple thousand dollars, depending mm -hmm. on the number of, of hours per week and number of weeks. Um, but it doesn't. Uh, our teaching assistant ships uh, do not provide uh, full stipend and uh, tuition support. Great. The next question: How long after the application deadline are stu deadline students are allowed to complete their file? So the GRE scores and TOEFL scores, how long after the deadline can you receive those? Oh, really, there's no set deadline. However, uh, you want to arrange to have them submitted as soon as possible. So just to give you a, a frame of reference, for uh, fall applications, we begin reviews of applications in January. Decisions for master's applications are usually complete by the first week or second week of February. The admissions for PhD uh, could happen as early as January, but they usually uh, happen sometime in mid to late February, sometimes even early to mid-March. It just depends on each individual faculty, faculty member's needs when funding is available or when they're notified of available funding and what they're thinking about when it comes to the numbers of students who are being admitted and if, uh, if they have to uh, seek someone else, for example, if uh, the first person they've offered admission declines. Right, but um, that being said, um, it's a good idea if you can get your um, all of your materials in by the December 15th deadline, mm -hmm. because that way when people look at the, your application, it'll be complete, it won't have missing pieces. Yeah. Thank you for that. The last question it looks like is from Surya. How important is it to have an undergraduate degree in MECI to apply? Uh, it's not important that you have a uh, mechanical engineering undergraduate degree. It is important that you have the appropriate skills to succeed in the kind of thing that you're doing. Uh, 